Katie. Hey, sweet Maya. Hey. I just came out to shoot a video, but I had to sit down and wait a minute because my camera keeps fogging up. Like literally, it's all damp from condensation from being in the cold house. Yeah. Well, it's it's only 8:20 in the morning. <laughs> it's already hot enough out here to make my camera fog up. Well, it's also raining yesterday. Yeah, that's true. What are you doing today? Um, just normal farm stuff, and then we're going to go watch a movie. Oh, yeah. Date day. Date day. Sweet Maya and I are going on a date day uh, to watch the new Downton Abbey movie this afternoon. That's one of our favorite TV shows of all time. The movie's been out for a little while, but we've just been really busy. And so today, Jeremiah's sister is coming, and so he and I are going to go catch a middle of the afternoon movie and I am gonna go down to the garden and harvest some stuff here in a moment but I'm gonna wait till my camera is not consistently fogging up it looks like it's adjusting because this picture hasn't fogged up yet now I'm sitting so you know might as well finish the coffee and have one last thing to go sit down and lose in the garden and we're a little foggy again but look how cute Katie is are you an unlikely farm dog Katie girl all right coffee's done Let's go down to the garden. This is my first like little harvest out of the vegetable garden this year. Now we've harvested onions and potatoes, but just as far as like going and harvesting something for dinner, this is the first time. There's this glorious haze over the farm. It's a little late in the morning. It's like, I don't know, 8.30 or so. All right, pit stop to turn on this hose. Hey, do I go? Here we go. So I'll move that hose around a couple of times over here to make sure I cover all these places and I'm gonna set another one up on the other end. But look at this. You'll notice a little difference here. We took out that old barn that was here. When we moved here, there were only a couple of structures. Um, we have two big like dry storage barns back in the back corner of our property. And then we had that barn, which we gave it like a quick facelift to use for our goats before we got our red barn built. We've left it up because the goats were still here and now they're not. Um, if you missed that, I did a vlog the other day where my friend Amanda from Welcome Grove Homestead, they've just relocated from California to Tennessee. And um, I called her, I don't know, probably like November and was like, hey, do you think that you would want these goats? Uh, she took some of the ones that were like very sentimental and special to me that were really good milkers. And I thought that would be a service to her farm as well as a safe place for, you know, animals that I cared about. So I've been hanging on to them for her they came they're getting settled and she came and picked them up and we then turned around and tore that barn down because that was the only reason why it was still there and that's been the plan from the beginning but it's really cool because it really opens up the view behind the greenhouse and the garden also this week um as you guys saw in a video the other day and um, that we're working on the plan for this garden space and I'm feeling pretty good about what I'm working out. So uh, probably tomorrow, I think, Jeremiah and I are gonna come out here and pull some lines and kind of get a real idea of our measurements and what our fence is gonna look like. And I'll show you guys when we do. Um, it's quite the process building a big garden like this because you pretty much have to think in phases. Um, we are not going to try to do it all at once. When you're building a lot, especially raised beds, I mean, just bringing all the soil in and all the different things, it adds up really quick. It takes a lot of time. So for us, this is definitely going to be at least a two-phase project because phase two, I mean, there's still potatoes growing in the other side of the garden. But we might even break it down further because of some of the structures we're putting in. I don't know. But I'm very excited to be working on that. It looks like another potato variety is starting to kind of change colors we'll probably be harvesting this variety next week once they really start dying back on top is when you know it's time to start pulling them out of the ground i want to give it as much time as possible so we can get as much size out of them but it looks like this row and this row is starting to get some brown spotting and it doesn't look like disease it just looks like normal phasing out all right 
It's pretty cool to be building that big raised bed garden with anticipation and excitement, but then also be able to come back here and harvest food from this garden. Today, I'm gonna to be harvesting several squashes. I'm gonna set you guys up where you can see with the time lapse, but I've been watching this squash. I actually haven't harvested any of it because uh, they were a little on the smaller side. Of course, if you're not feeding a ton of people and you wanna harvest small squash, they're super tender and delicious when you do that. You can really pull them at any size. When they start getting a lot bigger, the seeds get larger. The, uh, the uh, meat of the squash gets a little spongier. Um, and so they're not as great for like sauteing at that point, but if you're trying to like shred them and put them in like zucchini, bread or something like that it's a great thing to do with larger squash if you have one that you forget in your garden or you miss and it turns into the size of a small baby um, man that makes like several loaves of zucchini bread so you don't have to feel like you wasted something just because it got away from you but I've been purposefully letting these grow a little bit more um, because we have a big family and so if they can be like a little bit bigger then we're just gonna get more out of that fruit I've got one here that's pretty good sized can see that's just about right that one's a little on the big side uh, probably if I waited till the end of today that one would start getting a little spongy it'd still be usable but I have quite a few down in here we're having some friends over for dinner tonight and Maya and I were discussing what food we were gonna prepare and I was like you know it's getting to be the time of year that I've got stuff I can harvest and I said I think that we can make a whole meal off the farm came out here and I've got fresh summer squash, I have a lot of onions, I have a lot of potatoes, and we have chickens that we've raised here. So tonight, we will make our first full meal where everything on the table came from our farm here. Now we moved and we had brought things that, we brought some things that were canned, not a lot. We brought our freezers of meat, so stuff that was raised on our farm in Arkansas. But tonight will be the first full meal that we're making from our South Carolina farm. That's pretty exciting. All right, got my little shears. Let's pick these squash. Pause the time lapse. I'm gonna show this just because It'll help somebody. Some of you might be like, obviously, but we have to be willing to explain the obvious things if we're going to encourage people to do something they've never done before. All right, so the way that I harvest a squash, you can obviously, and just cut just a little bit into the stem. Then I twist it, which guarantees that it comes off, which guarantees that it comes off where I cut it. Okay, back to the time lapse. All right, I probably have about 15 more fruits on my plants that I'm leaving because they're a little on the smaller side and this will be plenty for dinner tonight. And by leaving them, it just means that I'm gonna get more volume of food. So I feel pretty good about that. This is about mm, three pounds of squash, I would say enough to feed two pretty good sized families for dinner. If I start preparing that, feel like I need more, I'll just come out here and pick some more this evening. I get asked a lot about harvesting, when's the best time, how's the best way of doing this. I did a long video when I was in Arkansas, I mean it's like extensive, talking about harvesting everything in your summer garden and even covering some things that typically grow in winter gardens for me. I'll link that uh, down below so you can go check it out if you want to watch kind of a long video on the subject that was going around my old garden and just talking about all different things. Um, the general rule is for most things you want to harvest early in the morning, earlier than I am right now. Ideally, like ideally, you want to harvest your stuff, most everything, before the sun hits it. So things before the sun hits them, they have a higher water content. Uh, higher water content just means they're gonna last longer. Now, if you don't have the capacity of doing that, uh, this morning, for me, I didn't want to let those grow for another full day because I felt like they would get too big. And I'm gonna be cooking dinner tonight, so it was either harvest them now 
because I got out here a little late or harvest them at five o'clock this evening or four, four o'clock this evening to start making dinner. And so now is obviously the better option. The thing with harvesting in the afternoon is that when you are under the hottest sun of the day and the highest heat, that water content is gonna be lower. And if you harvest everything habitually during the lowest water content that it has, it's gonna shrivel up faster. Now, one thing you can do if you are harvesting uh, squash, cucumber, especially anything leafy, this is really applies to anything leafy. Beans can shrivel quickly on the counter if you harvest them in the heat and their water content is low. Again, squash and cucumbers. Um, put them in some water. Uh, I had an older gentleman tell me once, um, he called it soaking the heat off. And I think really it's that you're letting them rehydrate. Just like if you take cut flowers and you put them in water, they perk up because they're rehydrating. Uh, but that's what, that's essentially what it is. Just put a big bowl of water and put that stuff in it and it'll plump back up. In fact, if you're harvesting any root vegetables, a lot of people ask me, I harvested carrots or radishes or even things that are not root vegetables like cucumbers. And you know, within a day they're shriveled up, they're like bendy and rubbery uh, you can soak them soak them in water as soon as you bring them in and that allows them to rehydrate so they're still gonna have some crunch in them the next day now the exception to that rule again I'm giving you the cliffs notes of that I don't know it's like a 40 or 50 minute video if you want kind of the longer details but um, the exception to that rule are fruits that you want to be less water content so higher water content on a thing like a cucumber you want higher water content but on like a pepper actually diluting the flavor so if you harvest like your peppers your tomatoes your melons in the afternoon you're gonna get a stronger flavor uh, so harvesting those in the heat of the day is actually a benefit because all of the sugars in that are more concentrated and less diluted um, what it really boils down to is harvest your garden when you can i mean it, none of those things are make or break it's still food and it's still probably better than any food you're going to buy at the store. It's still good food. But I have talked to people before who were like, you know, my stuff is rubbery by the same night that I picked it. What's going on here? This stinks. The stuff at the store doesn't do that. Um, it needs to be rehydrated. Or people who water the heck out of their tomatoes every single day and then harvest them in the evening after they've watered them all evening or in the, you know, they harvest them after they've given them a ton of water. And then they're like, these really don't taste as much better as I thought they would. That's because they're extremely diluted. They're full of water. So, you know, try to harvest those whenever it's hotter and they, they aren't diluted. All right, I'm gonna set this over here in the shade and walk down to the other high tunnel. All right, let's talk about the soil issue. All right, so I've been sharing with you guys the process of growing in this greenhouse and you know we set up our no-dig beds planted our started plants and everything kind of started out really fine and then started sort of going sideways i started noticing some curling and some stunting on some of the plants and what looks to me like herbicide damage it was very, very prevalent in the tomatoes, like you can see here. I mean, just really rough. And then, uh, same thing with the ground cherries, but a lot of them are just really, really stunted. Um, just this really hard curl on the leaves. And then the peppers are kind of all over the spectrum. Um, you know, some of them look pretty rough, as you can see here. And some of them look mostly okay throughout here. The ones on the other side look better, but that was a different bag of soil. So I think maybe there were kind of levels to this contamination. Um, eggplants, these are, like, there's only two varieties here. And so you're seeing it's not a variety thing. Um, there's some damage here. Now, interestingly, the things that are not in the solanaceous family, the nightshade family, um... They're fine. These cucumbers are fine. These zinnias are fine. I've got some holy basil here growing and looking lovely. This stuff is fine. So I've been kind of sharing this as it's developed um, and trying to figure it out, asking people, 
Anybody else had any issues this year? What's going on here? Here's my assumption. And I've heard suggestions all over the board. Um, different diseases like curly top and mosaic um you know just from leaf bugs or thrips or just whatever it could be being caused by pests high salt content in the soil um people have speculated could it be the cardboard and i just had to assume based on all the information i had like i don't think it's from the cardboard i've been using cardboard in gardens for a very long time. Um, all the cardboard that we use, mostly, I guess I should say most of it, a little bit comes from things we purchase, but mostly Will picks it up um, through a connection he has at a hospital. So it's mostly very large cardboard boxes um, with, I mean, very large with little to no print on them. Uh, people speculated could it be the glue in the cardboard, but that's a really intense reaction. Um, so, the other piece of information I had was that we used those bags in this high tunnel and then we used it on two rows out in the garden. One row has tomatoes. And the difference between the row that has this compost and the row that has a different compost is marked and they're right next to each other. Uh, so that was kind of what I needed to know to like trace it back. So yesterday, so I've been sharing this but I haven't like named the company on a video because I wanted to get to the bottom of it. But I started getting some emails from other people saying, hey, we're having the same issue, same thing, we're in your area, we bought soil from the same place. I've also been seeing, it should be noted, a lot of messages from people all over the country and even all over the world. Um, apparently there's been like a really bad issue with this in the UK um, where soil has been largely contaminated with something that is causing specifically nightshades to struggle. It's devastating that um, while food prices are going through the roof that home gardeners everywhere are struggling with soil, but I digress. Um, the company, Soil3, three, Soil3, um, Soil three, um, they reached out to me yesterday. So they had seen the videos and knew from me being a customer and having bought several bags of soil um, that that what was the issue that they were familiar with and they have been hearing a lot of complaints of people having the same issue and of course they're heartbroken and in talking to them yesterday they asked me to encourage anybody that's having issues with their soil that they purchased from them to contact them um, they are doing very extensive testing and nothing's showing up they are acknowledging that obviously there's a problem but they cannot come to the bottom of what it is because nothing that is commonly tested for is showing up in the tests now one thing that they're doing i'm going to be taking some really extensive pictures of these plants and this damage before i tear them out uh, because they're trying to gather as much evidence as possible as to, to what's going on and i'm also going to gather a soil sample to send in to them uh, for their testing and they are sending me some activated charcoal which is something that they're trying to uh, trial for remediating this problem and I'm gonna try that on these beds and then they asked me if I would be willing to you know maybe try to grow in this a time or two more with some of those remediations to see if it helps now worst case scenario and they are offering refunds to people who have had you know these issues so um, I appreciate good customer service I mean it stinks this really stinks but I also understand in talking to them that this is something that has happened to them also. They're building a greenhouse. They basically said they've always tested their soil, but whatever is in the soil is not showing up on tests. It's obviously causing a problem. So they're actually uh, building a greenhouse and they're going to test their soil with plants uh, because apparently this really heavily affects nightshades, specifically tomatoes. Um, I, was, I was the first one to tell them that it was also affecting my ground cherries as seriously, but I know that's not as common of a thing for people to grow, so they hadn't heard that yet. Uh, but they said it also really affects green beans, um, just or anything in the bean family. And so they're setting up a place that every batch of soil they're just going to test by growing something in it and see how it reacts which I think at this point is the best thing you can do. Um, it's been a lesson for me because having set all of this up um, I definitely will 
be a little slower to put a large amount of soil like this in my garden. Um, obviously we're trying to gear towards growing our own compost, but in setting up such a big space, we needed to bring some in. Um, but in the future bringing compost in, especially from a new place, I'm definitely going to be putting some plants in it first to see how it does um, and giving it a couple weeks of having something growing in it to make sure that it's actually safe. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, that's the confirmation that we definitely have an issue. Um, several people with the issue in the UK were telling me that it was a similar situation. Nothing that was showing up on tests, even down to like very, very, very in-depth tests. Um, and it's not showing up on them. Um, and it's causing the exact same issues, like severe stunting, curling of nightshades specifically, bean crops. I'm gonna try to grow some sunflowers in here. She did tell me that they're even seeing it affect sunflowers, which is just wild to me. Um, grass crops, corn crops are very hungry and are heavy feeders. And so essentially putting heavy feeders in here can help cleanse the soil. Another thing that I'm personally gonna do is get some compost teas and worm teas uh, going in a trash can with a bubbler. Um, Will's on vacation this week and he actually has the stuff to do that. And so when he gets back, I think we're gonna work on that and I'll show it to you guys. Uh, the thing with soil is, it is a community, it's full of living things. And when you have a contaminant or a toxin of some sort in your soil, one of the best ways to handle it is to give the, the good guys a boost, essentially, um, to help clean up and process whatever toxins are in that soil. So I'm thinking for remediation, we're gonna try the activated charcoal that Soil3 is um, providing. We are going to try to grow some heavy crops to pull things out. I am going to go ahead and pull the tomatoes and the ground cherries out for certain. Um, some of the peppers I think might still have the capacity to bear. Um, so I don't know yet 100% what I'm going to do there. I may just try spraying those composts and spreading the activated charcoal and seeing if we can get um, some health going. And the worst case scenario is, is if I cannot really um, rectify this, is scraping it out. And, you know, maybe spreading it in a far pasture where I don't have anybody grazing. This is one of those things that like, you know, in talking to Hillary yesterday, you know, she said, well, I really appreciate your empathy. And, I see that they're taking responsibility for this, which is important. I think that's really good for saying, hey, you know, like, this has happened. But for me, I mean, like, obviously they're trying to rectify the problem. It does stink. It wasn't my whole garden. I feel terrible for people that it was their whole garden. But um, I do have the honor and joy and responsibility of um, publicly growing this garden and my hope is is that if somebody sees us going through this issue maybe you got contaminated soil from a place that's not taking responsibility for it that's not trying to help you maybe I can find some solutions that can help people come to um, you know a solution for this problem so this is turning into quite the project this is why we're feeling like we're bumping that potager garden down around the greenhouse up. Um, we had talked about waiting until the end of the year and just growing fall garden in that, um, waiting till the end of the summer to even start. But considering the fact that this is pretty much a loss for this growing season, we are gonna go ahead and start building at least part of the potager garden so I can replant some tomatoes from the suckers of the plants that are growing outside. Uh, so maybe I can get some more peppers in. Um, and maybe get some nightshades because I really wanted to be able to can a lot this year and with what I have growing outside we'll definitely be able to eat fresh and make some salsa and make some recipes but that's not enough plants to do any sort of real canning for a family as large as ours so we'll figure it out together I really appreciate our soil cubed I guess is what they call it um, being so quick and pursuant in solving the issue. And 
in the emails that I was getting from other people saying they had the same issue, I was hearing the same thing. People were saying, hey, they've got this issue, they're doing testing, but here's what they're offering to try to fix it. Um, and I can really appreciate that. And I don't ever want to lend my voice to accusation. I would rather lend it to solution. So hopefully we can move forward. And if you are dealing with serious issues like this, because soil contamination, it's in a lot of soils right now. Don't know what it is, but there it is. And I want to encourage you guys not to give up uh, because this is not the norm for gardening. This is my first time in um, all my years of gardening to get something so contaminated that it actually cost me a crop. It's just too bad. It's just one of those things that I'm like, man, I get something that affects nightshades specifically. And the only place that I put it on my farm is the greenhouse full of nightshades. I should also add, it wasn't all the soil that I got from them because we had gotten a first delivery that was, um, that's what we put all down in the cottage garden, um, in the beds, in the asparagus beds, in the ground, just a little layer on the ground to kind of add nutrition. And everything down there is fine. Now, I don't know if that's because those aren't nightshades or if it's because, you know, it really, the earlier batches weren't contaminated. It could simply be that they weren't. Make sure that I'm hitting everywhere I want to be. Oh, I need to adjust that sprinkler. Ah! <laughs> oh, made it. On the plus side, everything out here looks amazing, minus that one bed that has tomatoes growing in it in that bad soil. Almost forgot my squash. Are you ready to go? Come on. All right, guys. Well, thank you for hanging out with me this morning. I'm always glad. Even with when what I'm sharing is not super fun or feel good, I'm glad to be able to share it. What an incredible joy to teach people how to grow food. Thank you, guys. I bless you. Until next time.